Hello there, my fellow samurai, and welcome back to some Warhammer Fantasy lore. Today, as part of our still fairly new Nippon series, even though this video marks a month since I started it, we're gonna expand our knowledge of Fantasy Japan's political system, court intrigue, their approach to warfare, and their relation with other major powers of the world. I am your host, Shogun Jideon, for today, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The way of the samurai is often considered synonymous with the way of the warrior, but in the land of the rising sun, samurai do not serve their clan solely on the battlefield. Politics has been a vital element in Nippon's history since the founding, and the negotiations and maneuvers of courtiers have changed the empire as often as war, if not even more so. Indeed, a skillful courtier can alter the outcome of a war even after the battle is fought. Although some bushy look down on courtiers and the subtle arts of politics, those who must serve their clans in court reject the notion that they are any less samurai than their warrior cousins. Courtiers must pursue their diplomatic struggle with the same courage and zeal as a bushi does in combat, because their failure can be as catastrophic as a lost war but their victory can bring glory and success to the clan even without a need to fight a war at all. Failure in court can mean death as certain as failure in combat. Courtiers must walk a perpetual knife's edge, working to obstruct, undermine and destroy the opponents without falling prey to the same fate themselves. In Nippon, politics take place primarily in the various courts of the empire. Every governor and daimyo maintains a court in a castle or palace inviting emissaries and visitors from other families and clans to attend them. The higher ranking the host, the more prestigious the court, and the more important will be the political discussion and negotiation taking place there. The most prestigious court of the empire, of course, is the imperial court, hosted by the emperor and his chief advisors. Many courtiers can spend a lifetime trying to get a posting there. The heaviest political activity takes place during the winter, and just as the imperial court is the most important and prestigious of political postings, it is the most desirable place to spend a winter. Court, more than any other part of Nipponese life, is suffused with delicate etiquette and indirect speech. After all, diplomats will speak for the clan, and have the weight and prestige of that clan behind them. A small daimyo who insults or ignores a courtier without legitimate cause could well be forced to commit seppuku for the breach of etiquette. Nor is anyone so rude as to openly discuss alliances or treaties in open court. Trained diplomats employ hints and subtle conversation gambits to suggest a possible topic of discussion. Much of the really important or crucial negotiations will take place in private meetings, rather than the open court where others might overhear it. Political agreements of Nippon are seldom expressed as written treaties, however, except for when both sides want to present a formal agreement to the rest of the empire. More commonly, the negotiations are handled via personal commitment and word of honor. Clans trust their courtiers to handle a delicate situation, and the courtiers, in turn, call upon the trust of the clan to give their word weight. Indeed, minor daimyo or provincial officials may well have difficulty keeping their position if a powerful courtier speaks out against them to their lord, especially if the courtier's accusation turns out to be true. Another major part of politics in Nippon is exchanging letters, and experienced courtiers spend a lot of time and effort every day in composing and sending out missives to each other. A good courtier can maintain a steady flow of correspondence with dozens of people from across the empire dropping tiny tidbits of information to them and carefully reviewing the snippets of information that they send in return. For many courtiers, this network of correspondence can be just as important as their allies in court. Indeed, a timely piece of information from the far side of the empire can turn the entire course of a negotiation, and the fame and fortune of a courtier can be founded, built or shattered with a single letter. 
Within the courts themselves, critics and blackmailers alike employ letters as a weapon of choice, and lovers use them as their most subtle but most direct gift. This continual flow of correspondence within a court is known as the game of letters. Unlike letters which are sent to those outside the court, these are designed primarily to display skill and manipulate others, rather than convey information. Although the Nipponese religion often focuses on peace and compassion, many samurai are bushy, raised in the path of arms, and taught to seek glory and fame on the battlefield. Small wars and border skirmishes are a constant reality of life in the land of the rising sun, with the many clans perpetually jockeying for power and influence, and major wars do erupt with some regularity. During a period of crisis, like the eras of the warring clans, war is nigh on constant, and major clashes of arms become a regular part of everyone's life. The armies of Nippon are primarily infantry forces. The native Nipponese pony is not hardy enough to support a full-scale cavalry, although it can be used effectively for scouting and mounted infantry. Thus, the only samurai who employ true cavalry tactics in Nippon are the Taneka, who import their horses out of cafe. Other Nipponese armies develop some degree of anti-cavalry training and tactics, but their lack of full-size horses prevented them from deploying any kind of large-scale cavalry force against them. They usually deploy in rectangular blocks, wider than they are deep. However, the Nipponese usually do not have the concept of the phalanx or maintaining a shield wall. It is expected that two enemy units collide on the battlefield and the soldiers on each side will engage each other in personal combat. Consequently, the Nipponese march and advance in a more dispersed and open formation than other old world armies. And once contact is made with the enemy, any formation will quickly break down in a sprawl of hundreds of small melees. Thus, any battlefield tactics tend to focus more on pre-contact maneuvering, bringing more troops to bear on the decisive point through decisive scouting or skillful march and deployment, also wearing down the enemy with archery and magical attack prior to engagement, as well as successfully withdrawing and rallying units after combat. It is the daimyo who are the feudal lords of Nippon, outranked only by the shogun and the imperial family. They have nigh on complete autonomy in the day-to-day -day running of their territories, and it is therefore unsurprising that civil strife is common as the daimyo fight over resources or pursue personal vendettas. Though bound by the way of the warrior like any other samurai, the daimyo tend to be more pragmatic about its application, as they involve themselves in the politics of the empire. Although the emperor owns all the land within the borders of the realm, he has granted members of the samurai class the honor of protecting and overseeing his affairs, acting as stewards over the vast majority of land. The samurai that have oversight of a particular area are thus granted the title daimyo, and given permission to swear other samurai into their service. Rather than serving the emperor directly though, a daimyo of this kind is usually appointed by and subordinate to the ruling daimyo of the family or clan which controls the province where this land falls. The main responsibilities of a daimyo of this kind are protecting the assigned territory and ensuring that proper taxes are collected. To fulfill these responsibilities, he is allowed to take a portion of the rice and other goods produced in the province to equip and maintain samurai sworn to his service. Each family recognized by the emperor has a designated leader who is the daimyo of the family. The family daimyo are the highest authority within their own family, although they are subordinates of the daimyo of their clan. The family daimyo are also the honorary heads of that family school. The actual duties of running the school are often delegated to someone more inclined to teaching, or in the case of families with multiple schools, someone who is more familiar with the lessons. Nevertheless, for any matter that would require the attention of the head of the school, the family daimyo's approval would be required, whether or not he has an active hand in teaching. The leader of a clan, whether be it great or minor, is also given the title daimyo, further confusing the situation, although these are most often referred to as the champion of the clan. The clan daimyo are also, most of the time, the daimyo of the family within the clan. The clan daimyo are also the most powerful in the empire, second only to the emperor and the shogun, 
in both political and military power. The Taisho is a military rank similar to captain, and the Taisho will have many Chu Yi and their units serving beneath him, and they report directly to the Daimyo. From a general standpoint, Nippon is not a very open society and by default distrusts foreigners, save those from cafe maybe. Meanwhile, all old worlders are viewed as hairy savages. When the shogun Yorimoto Ieyasu rose to power and reunited the warring states of Nippon, he imposed certain restrictions on foreigners as well as restricting his own people from leaving. Most foreigners are thus confined or sealed off to an area in whichever city they are occupying, and actually dealing with them is done by the lower class of the merchants. They do have very few dealings with the empire, and few imperial merchant ships have ever made the long and dangerous journey that far east. However, the empire is anxious to change that, not least because of Marienburg's enviable position with Nippon and the Far East as a whole. They do not want to be barred from the riches of the Far East, as they were from Lustria, though this has to do more with the alliance between Marienburg and Ulfuan than anything else. Karl Franz, therefore, had sent a diplomatic mission to Nippon to cement some kind of alliance or treaty. Unfortunately, the progress on that has been slow. The fact that they are confined to a sealed-off foreign quarter in the capital of Hyudo possesses great problems as well as many days can go on without any meeting with Nipponese officials, and to add insult to injury, the translators present in all of these dealings are Marienburgers. However, the Imperials have been successful in converting a few people of Nippon to the cult of Sigmar, both in and outside the city. Sigmar's appeal to the new converts is one of strength and unity, and they view him as just another kami or god. With dozens of Nipponese Sigmarites created, maybe the Empire can make some gains someday. As mentioned, the most important Old World trading partner of Nippon is Marienburg. It was Marienburg that brought guns to Nippon, and one of the merchant houses, the Den Oiwe, has an heir married to a daimyo's daughter, Lady Katsi Okumoto. It is not presumptuous to say that Marienburg has a decent foothold in Nippon. Although they are, like the Imperials, confined to sealed off quarters of Hyudo for most of the time, they also occupy a tiny island just off the port city called Dejim. And this tiny island is complete with its own set of keys so that the ships can anchor there. The Marienburgers were given the island when they first came to Nippon in order to keep their influence away from the population, as the Jinto priests viewed them with disdain. But on Dejim, the Marienburgers are free to do whatever they want although the Shogun still has eyes and ears there. Surprisingly, Nippon itself has a tiny community in the city of Marienburg. It was there quite a few years before the present Shogun made it even more difficult for people to leave his island. And while he was opposed to it in the beginning, he eventually became accustomed to the arrangement. Meanwhile, the nation of Estalia, especially the seaport of Magrita, is in competition with Marienburg when it comes to securing trade in the Far East. This has even escalated to fighting in the Ind Ocean between ships of Estalia and those of Marienburg. As these incidents are very embarrassing to both nations, they have conveniently chosen to brush them under the carpet. The Estalians have not been as successful as the Marienburgers in their dealings with Nippon but they do occupy a bit of the merchant quarters in the port of Tokaido. The Marienburgers obviously are unhappy with their presence, and rumor has it that both sides are seeking to sabotage each other. Finally, the High Elves used to live in several Nipponese cities pre-incursions of Chaos. But when Tor Elifis was attacked by Chaos, the vast majority of the Elves in Nippon left to defend it. Small communities lived on in some of the cities, but over the years they gradually left as well. Most of them chose to go back to Ulfuan, but those that didn't chose to go to the Gates of Caliph and reinforce the garrison there against random attacks by Chaos forces. To this very day, that is where they stay. The High Elves, unlike the Old Worlders, are welcome in Nippon, although they are often feared as well. The Phoenix King, although he would like to regain Thor Elephis, is more concerned about keeping his island territories, which include the Fortress of Dawn, the Tower of Stars, Tor Elasor, and the Tower of the Sun. 
However, this didn't prevent High Elven Clippers from exploring the vast ocean east of Nippon. As in the past, the Dark Elves of Nagaroth actually sailed a Black Ark from the Western New World all the way to the coast of Cathay. Fortunately, the Black Ark was destroyed, preventing a possible Druki invasion. Although, good luck invading a land as populous as Cathay with the numbers that the Dark Elves possess. That would be akin to Canada invading China. And this, my fellow Daimyo, has been what I wanted to narrate for you on the politics, leaders, diplomacy, and warfare in Nippon for today. I didn't go that much into the soldiers and various unit types today, as those videos are coming in the future. And there's definitely gonna be more than one of those. Also, I couldn't help ignoring the fact that in this scenario, the Stallions were the real-life Portuguese slash Spanish, and the Marienburgers, at least thematically, were the Dutch. Which would make the Hyles the British? I don't know about that one. Anyway, as always, I look forward to reading your thoughts on all this Nippon lore in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this or found it informative, do leave a like, share, subscribe, and click the bell icon for future content. Thanks a lot and the blessings of Amaterasu be upon you.